Today we'll be discussing the subject of bellows, um, which tend to be fatigue sensitive. And since we covered fatigue last week uh, in the previous lecture, I thought it would be very valuable to show an application of bellows, um, which is one of the, one of a very, very tough component that's used uh, in many different applications, including launch vehicle design. So the bellows applications typically come, um, their standards that come for those. And the, here's some resources you can look at. Uh, NASA Space Vehicle Design Criteria, NASA SP 8123. You have the Standards of Expansion Joint Manufacturer Association. You have this bellows flow induced vibration uh, document, NASA TM 82556. And then you have the Metal Expansion Joints Manufacturers. So we'll be going through some of those materials because bellows have been a cause of failure for a lot of different systems. Uh, metallic bellows are manufacturing expansion joints commonly used in aerospace, chemical plants, power, point, power, power systems, sorry about that, heat exchangers, automotive parts, piping systems, petrochemical plants, and so forth. And they're really subject to high pressure and temperature environments. Bellows are special structures that require high tensile strength, high strength, as well as good flexibility. So, so not only do bellows have to take pressure and temperature, they're really used to be able to accommodate deflections. So for example, this pipe here uh, is gonna expand due to the pressure, the temperature may make it expand. These bellows are there to, to absorb that extra deformation uh, and allow flexibility in the line. Often bellows suffer excessive deformation, displacement, heat expansion, vibration, and there's other possible reasons, but uh, bellows can be tough to analyze and test. Uh, during service, the bellows are subjected to compression, tension, bending loads, and cyclic loads. And the failure of these bellows also occurs before, be, due to improper design. Elastic vessels that can be compressed when pressure is applied to the outside of the vessel uh, or extended on the vacuum. So these are basically, I, I see them as vessels that, that, that basically have this, this accordion deflection. When the pressure vacuum is released, then the bellows returns back to original shape, provided that the material has not stressed past its yield strength. Bellows can operate in the plastic range, but usually you get a life cycle issue. There's a limitation in fatigue there. And you guys, you already learned about low cycle fatigue in the previous lecture. The space shuttle main engine was such an engine that used bellows in, and it did encounter uh, some issues. Uh, there are many problems and failures of these elements during development testing, and they have to like come up with several approaches to overcome bellows engine failures. And that, that, that led to a lot of work also too. Um, and prior to that, uh, bellows have been used in launch vehicles significantly. Here you can see the Saturn V used a bunch of different bellows. Um, for the turbine exhaust system, for the pump inlets, propellant feed, hydraulics, so forth. And <clears throat> at the time they were talking about, you know, what kinds of fluids you could have, LOX, fuel, helium, nitrogen, and so forth, temperature range of operation, operating pressure range, line ID, and so forth. These are the kinds of materials you could encounter when you're designing bellows. And we can then look at um, Saturn V, J2, and Saturn II stage. And feel free to kind of pause and think about this. I don't want to go into extensive detail. My point is that it's being used in launch vehicles a lot. And uh, stage, stage one, stage two tanks, uh, engines, and then the, a lot of different fluid systems, typical materials uh, such as Inconel, uh, Crest, and so forth. And on the right hand side, what you see there is the types of uh, bellows you can have. You can have braided uh, and things like that. You have the M1 1964 used bellows as well. The Apollo service modulus engine used it. Um, and then we have the Nerva XC used it. The Titan III used it. You can see that here, the various um, bellows that we have. Um, the type of bellows we have, the materials used, and the temperature of operation. 
And here's an example of a failure for the space shuttle main engine. It failed due to high cycle fatigue crack that initiated in the inner radius of triple leg one. Um, and so that caused the, these bellows to fail. And th this particular bellows had gone through a lot of testing, uh, 90 starts, 30, 000, 32,000 seconds or so. Um, and it was found that later on, it was found that the radius was significantly lower, smaller than expected per the drawing. And so with bellows, it's very tough. When you manufacture them, you may not get what you need. And that's why it's a good idea to cut them up the first time you use them, make them, to see if it came out as, as you thought it would come out. Failure number two was an Apollo 6 mission. Um, again, a malfunction of the entire Saturn program there. Um, and again, uh, Bellows played a role in this particular failure event. Anomalies uh, involved the second and third engines. Uh, they did a lot of ground testing. Here, what you see is a, is a cross section of the bellows. And here you see the braid. Uh, and you can see that uh, there's a, a different behavior in ambient versus vacuum conditions. And here's a nomenclature of bellows. You have here the root here at the bottom. Uh, these are bellows length. When I say bellows length, that's what I mean. This is a cross section, by the way. So imagine this 360. This is a center line. You can see there, the center line. That's the end of the pipe diameter. The effective diameter is this one right here. And then you have the outer diameter that goes all the way out there. You have the flank portion, which is a straight portion. The crest portion, which is the curved portion you see here. And then the thickness of that bellow wall. You also have that bellow length here. And this is a pitch from volume to volume. I call this volume or convolutions. And these are formed, these, these, these walls are formed using that process. Bellows is a flexible seal design that contains the media, absorbs thermal movement and pressures of the system. Bellows elements have end fittings to match adjoining pipe fittings. Bellows are manufactured from thin wall tubing to form a corrugated cylinder. And corrugations are convolutions and contain system pressure. That's really what they do. Corrugations are convolutions and contain system pressure. You can see that here. Step one um, and then step two is shown. The bellows are first formed from a metal cylinder in two steps. The bellows length are approximately one third the length of the original cylinder. And then you add the flanges to complete the fabrication process. Here you can see the manufacturing more top level. You cut uh, cutting on the thin bellow layers here, uh, roll them up, uh, weld them. You usually have to weld them. And then uh, you have to put inner and outer layers because sometimes there's multiple layers. So here you see one layer. So here you see one layer, but there could be multiple layers of those. And so you can stack them in there and then uh, you form them. Um, and after you form them with the die, here you have a hydraulic powered forming process. Um, you then uh, have, uh, you can see multiple plies through a thickness, uh, the edge cuttings right here, and then you attach the, the ends. The design incorporates thickness and convolution geometry that meets the capacity of adjoining pipe to contain system pressure. Here you can see the pitch is 0.63, the height is 0.6, and then here is 0.18, and this is the diameter that's six inches. So that, that's a material thickness uh, here, 0.18. And here, this particular design has a four to one burst pressure, meaning if it's gonna operate 100 PSI was designed to take 400 PSI, for example. So how do you achieve flexibility in these designs? Uh, through the convolution profile, for example, the pitch uh, as multiple convolutions are required to provide expansion and contraction, the pitch can help you provide that flexibility as well. Design drivers, operational loads, pressure, temperature, external deflections, design, material, movement, per convolution, and so forth. Accessories, typically you're gonna have covers, uh, and the covers are to protect uh, the bellows from impact. That can be a problem. Any impact, these are so thin that it's easy to damage. 
flow liners are also typically installed. You can see a flow liner here. Uh, and that protects the bells from erosion damage due to abrasive media or resonant vibration. Some uh, cases you have tie rods and the tie rods are devices that restrain the bells from, from pressure thrust. If you have a lot of thrust, you could compress the bells too much. The tie rods prevents that from happening. Limit roads uh, is the one you see here on uh, the top here left and are devices that are primarily functioning to restrict the bellows movement range. The limit rods are then designed to prevent bellows overextension or over compression. Control rods are also used and their devices attached to distribute movement between two bellows. Here you have accessories again, uh, unless restrained, uh, the pressure is going to stretch the bellows a lot. Uh, but when you install them, it's going to uh, restrain the, the, the expansion joint from going uh, uh, expanded too much. Some basics of single bellows. So here you can see a single bellow configuration. This is single type, simplest type of bellow expansion joint. And it consists of weld elements, uh, normally flange or pipe ends. And the single bellows can absorb small amount of axial, lateral, and angular movement. Okay, so that, that's good. You also have the uni universal expanse, expansion joint. Uh, and the universe, universal expansion, expansion joint, uh, it consists of two bellows uh, interconnected by a center spool piece with flange or pipe at the end. So you have this flange and pipes at the end. The universal arrangement allows greater axial and lateral and angular movement than uh, single bellow. So basically you have bellows in either side, but it gives you a lot more flexibility. Um, and increasing the center spool and provides more movement capability. You still need guides and all that to keep it all safe. Externally pressure expansion joints, uh, basically you have a liner that, that's subject to pressure and acts externally on the bellows by a pressure chamber that can happen. And so yeah, so that needs to be considered. You also have tied single bellows. So you have rods at the ends. Um, I kind of covered that already. They're tied uh, and carries the pressure thrust. Uh, these basically carry the thrust of the, of the engine. You have tied universal joints. Again, similar idea spooled um, with some pin joint here. And then you also have the tied universal joint here. Similar concept, the one above. These rods take the load, any axial load, basically. You have the hinge expansion joint that allows a rotation about this gimbal point here, this point here, this hinge, uh, and that allows more flexibility. It also only allows uh, movement or rotation about one axis. Um, there are designs that mo allow movement in multiple axes, and that would be the gimbal expansion joint. You can have, you can see a pin here and a pin here. That allows uh, rotation in multiple axes. There's a lot of types of bellows. Uh, most of them are stainless steel application. Depending upon what you want, you're going to have a particular spec for that. And it's going to depend upon a lot of different factors. You can, so uh, depending upon what application you want um, and depending on what protections you need, you basically decide which. Um, steel you want to um, use. And if you want a, a highly corrosive application, then 316L makes sense. High operating pressure, then 321, and so forth. You have to just make those decisions based upon what you have in the application. Nickel alloys are very, very, very common. Um, nickel 200 has great mechanical properties, great corrosion resistance. So again, um, you, you choose depending upon what's the failure mode of concern. And here in the list below, you see uh, the material types, uh, Inconel, Pastelloy, and then you choose which one you need for a particular application. Stress corrosion, fatigue, carbide, squirm, and rupture. Typical materials for bellows, uh, you can see here another list. I, I think all I'm doing is kind of repeating this so you can see the different ways you can see the information. Uh, you can see here uh, the mechanical properties, uh, strength per density ratio, uh, the forming limits, uh, and you can also look at uh, 
the the cost, uh, the the relative line per cost. Um, in in Cornell uh, tends to be expensive, uh, titanium, um, and some of these have really good strength. Like Inconel has good, really good strength, sixty sixty one and so forth. So this is very good information to kind of study what's going on. Uh, other typical materials for bellows. Uh, what I'm showing here is the fluid, the temperature, the pressure application, and what is a recommended recommended alloy for it. Um, and again, if you have uh, liquid hydrogen or gas hydrogen, whatever you have, fuel, whatever, there's a set of bellows or alloys that are more appropriate for that application. Typical materials for bellows, uh, they're important factors for selecting materials. Uh, you want to be able to form them, uh, you want to make sure you have good corrosion properties, good low cycle fatigue properties, metal working applications important. Uh, in convolution portion, they're difficult to clean. Uh, and so you want to basically have a good understanding of uh, the corrosion coatings, for example. Uh, material characteristics are desirable, high strength to weight ratio, good weldability, good elongation. Here's an example of the movements you can have. So axial is this way, axial extension, axial compression is this way, torsion is this way, lateral offset, and then angular rotation. You, the bellows, if it's going to be accommodating any of this, your analysis needs to be able to take, take that into account. Bellows flexibility, very important. Uh, these are neutral bellows, these are compressed bellows, and then these are expanded bellows. That's just to show you what the bellows can do. Um, and then if I do a cross section of this and look inside what's going on when the bellows is in neutral position, that's a red. And when it's compressed, you can see how this here acts like a hinge and the bellows compress in this manner. When it's extended, then this also acts like a hinge at the top and then it expands in that manner. So that's what you see. Um, and here's what you will see for an angular rotation. Uh, more the pitch increases at the top, decreases at the bottom. And the lateral movements of a single bellows versus um, a double joint, or if you have angular offset, this is gonna, the way it's going to look like. The lateral movement this is going to stay straight, move down, this moves up, and they're going to have some sections in high pitch and smaller pitch. Here you can see the bellows offset here as well for a double uh, a universal bellows. If I have a hinge expansive joint, again, top expands, bottom compresses the way I'm showing it, and double hinge will be the way I'm showing it here. Multiply bellows is very convenient. So I show you already, you can have multiple plies uh, across the thickness, and that's done to increase fatigue life. Lower forces are required. Uh, the reduced thickness of the individual bellows results in lower bending stresses due to actual motion. Multiple plies act in unison as, a, as far as hoop pressure loading is concerned, but act individually when fatigue and life uh, is calculated. So the, the, the advantage of the having these multiple plies is fatigue life, uh, is there's lower force uh, while trying to retain the same pressure. That's really the advantage there. If you, sometimes I put holes in the outer ply, so if there's any entrapped air, it can escape during high temperature operation. Because imagine if I have air between two plies and then I heat up the air, the air wants to expand, but this, since these plies are so thin, so thin that you could just blow them apart. And so the holes can help release that air. Uh, one ply versus multiple plies. Uh, one ply, um, relatively cheap, is easy to do non-destructive evaluation, uh, relatively thick, robust, higher spring rate, higher lateral stiffness, well repair is great. The characteristics of two and and the higher number of bellows is individual pliers are relatively thin, total wall thickness is thick, is extremely flexible in all directions because now I have multiple plies, very short compared to single ply, and you can monitor any leaks. 
multiply construction with the same total thickness as a single construction. You have pressure capacity, fatigue life, spring forces, and bellow stability. So multiple pi effects, I mean, that, that's very helpful to know that you gain, you gain more when you go to multiple plies. Uh, the bell stability is lower, so you, you can have buckling easier uh, with this kind of bellows. Um, and the forces in each bell will be less. And the fatigue life increases. And the circumferential membrane stresses uh, and meridi meridional membrane stresses are unaffected since the total bellows thickness is about the same as if you were single. So here what we're trying to do is compare multiple ply to single ply. That's really what we're doing here. Um, okay. And then if you have multiple ply construction with the same thickness for each ply, as a single ply construction. So uh, the pressure capacity of the bill is higher, the effect of uh, fatigue will be le less, uh, bell stability will be increased. So what if you have multiple ply construction with greater thickness for each ply than for single ply? The pressure, again, capacity increases, there's a decrease in fatigue life since you have higher stresses, the spring forces will be higher uh, due to the total material thickness. And then the bellows stability is increasing since you have also a total material thickness is higher. So the spring rate in very low pressure application, the more significant force may be the spring rate, which is expressing pounds per inch of motion. And as the pipe grows due to increasing pressure and temperature, the bellows will resist compression by the force uh, in the spring rate. A comparison of pressure and force data to spring rate will show that it does not require very much line pressure for pressure thrust to be the dominant factor of two in expansion joint applications. Pressure effects, the bellows very nature of being flexible will extend due to the line pressure. This pressure has to be absorbed by something. And so uh, that will cause the bellows to extend and tear itself apart. Um, and so, yeah, that happens. You can see that here, even when it's curved, you can get that pressure expanding it. The pressure thrust force acts on the piping system uh, and it varies directly with the pressure in the line. So one thing that is done typically is to uh, attach these pipes to anchors and the pipe will have to react uh, the pressure um, in the way you're sh showing it here, basically. So the mechanics, uh, when you apply pressure, um, the spring here represents the actual spring rate of the bellow, and the hydraulic the piston here represents the effect of the pressure thrust. Uh, and the point here is that that pressure is gonna cause an expansion of this joint. And a lot of these expansion joints are designed for lateral offset or angular motion. However, usually the effects of pressure thrust is the same. Circumferential membrane stress due to pressure. Uh, so this stress here, uh, you're gonna have that stress occurring. And that formula is provided by the expansion joint manufacturer. And that's gonna be caused due to the pressure difference between the inside and outside of the bellows. And then you also have this meridional stress, which is a stress going this way. And this is S2, this is S4, that stress right here. So that's your meridional membrane stress. But, and, and there's other details here that I won't go into. Uh, bottom line is that that's, that's a stress that needs to be considered. And then you have bellow stability. So the idea there is when you apply pressure, um, internal pressure, and if the ends are restrained to some extent, then the bellows can squirm. We call this squirming. Um, and column squirm is basically a buckling event. You can look at an instability event and things will go haywire because uh, the, 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 the wall is so thin. You also have the meridional bending stress due to the deflection. So 
just like you had the meridional membrane stress due to pressure, if you bend the bellows, you're going to have, or deflect the bellows, you're going to have some stress in this direction. So what is the effects of various design parameters? Um, this is very useful. Uh, I encourage you to, to kind of pause and think about it. But uh, if I vary, and let me show you what this table is. So uh, variation. So thicker material, thinner material, higher convolute, lower convolute, smaller pitch, larger pitch, more pliers, fewer pliers, large diameter, smaller diameter, more convolutions, fewer convolutions. And so what you want to do in the design, you fully want to understand what are they, when you're designing the system, you want to understand all these parameters. Because you don't want a heavy system. When you're flying a rocket, you need something very, very light. So you want to consider the multiple parameters in the design process. You want to use optimization. A lot of people are now using artificial intelligence, machine learning, to really figure out what parameters I need to optimize. And we'll be doing some of that. You, you will have the opportunity to look at that. Um, one thing I want to point out, when you see this, this legend here, plus means increase, minus means decrease, S is the same. What I'm talking about here is that the stress increases in the hoop direction. So this is the S2. When I said S2 earlier, that's the circumferential stress. S4 is the meridional stress. So minus one, so what that means, it decreased, right? That's what it means. This means stay the same. So this is very helpful in understanding when I go to a thicker material, what is it doing to my spring rate? Well, here clearly it increased plus. And then you have one, two, and three at the bottom. When you see a three, that means the design variable changes by the cube of the variable. So meaning the spring rate increases to the cube of the thickness. Two means the design variable changes by the square of the variable. And when you see one is a linear behavior. So for example, the stress linearly changes with thicker material. So this is very helpful because you can look at the parameters that matter, the parameters that don't matter in the design process. More plies typically lead to a cycle life uh, that's about the same, for example. So uh, check this out, look at this carefully. It's very helpful to des design. Uh, standards, typically, they're based on NASA SP8123, ISO standard uh, 10,785, uh, ASME B31.3, the Expansion Joints Manufacturer uh, Association as well. Uh, and the bellows will often quote two different cycle lives, and it's going to depend upon whether you're going by ASME or EJMA. Uh, typically, EJMA provides a higher cycle life count. But bellows generally are workmanship sensitive and fitter modes are very complex, which is why I'm going through this material. The EJMA bellows fatigue curve is the best fit curve based on data that was available. Uh, that's how that works. The SME curve was developed based on bellows fatigue data, but it does provide design margins consistent with um, their equipment codes. Historically, designers have put large factor of safety on the number of design cycles for bellows. That's typically the case. A fatigue curve with safety factors was put in this here. And yeah, just make sure that when you're using this, uh, you understand the basis for uh, the fatigue curves. There's challenges with bevels, a lot of build-to-build -build variability. Um, so when you're looking at this, you're going to see that one bellow can behave totally different from the next one. And when you look at a, a, a vehicle that's ascending in space, you're going to see that there's a dynamic interaction in the piping system um, for a bellow, from one bellow to another. And so that's why stiffness are actually measured as part of the, quality, the acceptance test program. You check the, the, the stiffness to make sure everything's good. Um, and so, the effects of manufacturing uh, can be significant mechanical and geometry can be a problem. Differences in strength and toughness, differences in stiffness. And geometrically speaking, we're talking about ply thickness, imperfect contact between the plies, because the plies are not perfectly contact. 
Uh, also, large dimensional tolerances. All that stuff makes Bellows complicated to analyze. And the design of Bellows is complex. It requires the evaluation of pressure, uh, capacity, stress due to deflection, fatigue life, spring forces, instability. Instability is not easy to, to predict. Uh, and you need to account for all the parameters, reinforcement, manufacturing technique, material type, heat treatment. And so the design for a particular application will involve a, comp a compromise of conflicting requirements. For example, if I need high pressure, I need a bill of constructive thick material, but then I want low forces, you know. So you're comp you have competing effects uh, and you have to figure out how to balance them. The design environments are also complex. The vibration environments, flow induced, so as the flow is, is, is flowing, uh, the, the bellows will start vibrating. Internal pressure transients, like water hammer events. Uh, mechanical loads can also be present. Um, unlike other pressurized components, internal pressure typically does not dominate the design environment for metallic bellows. Enforced deflections, like thermal expansion, installation misalignment. If I put the bellows misaligned, that's a new stress state that's different from if it was straight and every installation can look different. So that's a challenge. Failure modes are complicated. The most common metallic bellows failure you will see is fatigue and fracture. And fatigue usually going to be circumferential fatigue cracks near the convolution roots and crowns. The mechanical forming process causes this localized cha changes in material ductility, which leads to fatigue cracks. Causes of fatigue failure, there are many of them. It can be handling installation it could be pressure cyclic events you could have even environmental effects like surface uh, oxidation uh, operating in elevated temperatures vendor process dip, drift there could be changes to how the bills are made over time wells are defective uh, other metallic bellows include buckling stability i already covered that interply rupture if you have trapped fluid in between plies and for whatever reason gets heated up stress corrosion cracking, and premature failure due to internal pressure transients. The failure most per EJMA uh, include shipping and handling damage, um, improper installation, improper anchoring, bellows corrosion, system overpressurization, bellows vibration, excessive bellows movement, bellows erosion, and bellows convolutions. You have instability. Uh, convolutions can be added to increase movement without sacrificing life. Uh, but there's a limit to what you can do. So that's something to consider. Uh, you can try, uh, but other things will suffer. Fatigue uh, of bellows. Uh, here's an example of um, damage as a function of number of cycles. Um, and the more the number of cycles, the more the damage. Um, so uh, if I have a lot of, I, if I have low number of cycles, I'm sorry, you have a great amount of damage due or the strain is higher. Uh, and we, we learned that in low cycle fatigue, high cycle fatigue. If the loading conditions into the part are small, then you have much higher cycle life. And you can construct these kind of plots with, with testing. That's, that's very doable and is done very frequently. Damage to the bellows during processing, shipping, and installation is a continuous problem. Damage to, to, due to static seal, sealing surface can be a problem. Ducts having low spring rate bellows can easily be abused. Uh, and fatigue concerns come into play. So you have to look at that. And again, damage due to bellows due to handling can be a problem. Protective covers are used to protect it. Dense nick and scratches are very common. Misalignments occur because nothing is perfect when you're installing a bellow. And so things will be uh, you know, not quite aligned. And that can occur due to, due to assembly or due to thermal loads. Thermal loads can also cause that. So what are the recommended practices to qualify a bellow? You do a proof pressure test, uh, typically 1.2 factor on the operating pressure, including the transients or one and a half uh, operating pressure, whichever is greater. Typically, that's the way it's done. You don't want any structural failure in that proof pressure test. 
that proof of pressure test is done to verify workmanship. That's really the, you want to verify that when it was made, it was made well. And so you pressurize it for that reason. Leak test, uh, very important after a proof test to make sure that there's nothing that could leak. You want to examine the product to make sure everything's in place, that you didn't damage anything. Movement verification, spring rate verification. This is important for a couple of those analyses. I'll cover that later. But you want to make sure that the bellows has adequate uh, behavior uh, on their stiffness, on their loading, and that the stiffness is appropriate. Buckling has to be looked at. Flexural endurance, uh, so basically cycling it uh, to make sure it can survive the environments. Mechanical vibration, flow vibration, so you flow the fluid to see how it can, how it does, um, and then pressure impulse. You also do uh, section in the thickness to, to see if everything matches the drawings. And then finally a burst test, basically taking the component to, to failure by pressurizing. And typically the factor we're looking at is one and a half to two and a half. There's a lot of uh, typical things are done. Here is more summarized. Like before you make go take the bill to proof pressure, you do a pretest, for example. And uh, you want to check that the drawings are good, the dimensions are good. Stiffness verification right after, leak test, post test verification, thermal shock testing, live testing to four X, vibration test, stability test, ultimate test, and burst test. And this vibration test is going to put the bellows on their MIA, six dB loading, so uh, that's excitation for three minutes per axis, as an example. Uh, the life test is taking the bells and cycling it four times the number of deflection cycles. So where you install the bellows, you install them where you have a lot of deflection. The piping is trying to, is overtaxed. It can't take the thermal, it can't take the pressure. Bellows can re relieve that. But they're basically a spring. Think, think of bellows as a spring. The edgeman design equations, have been derived over time. And I don't wanna go through them because they're in that book and I'll be providing a spreadsheet that does some of these calculations. Bottom line is uh, you can calculate the stresses using those design guidelines. You can then do an analysis later to kind of check it. Find elements which we'll be doing as well as part of the project. You can calculate fatigue life uh, using their formulas and I don't want you to memorize these formulas because they're just stress formulas. You may recognize some of these stress formulas. Um, and then you can also predict instability. You can also come up with a spring rate. So a lot of research has been done in this area and people have done a lot of work to figure it out. This, this is a, a worksheet, very nice worksheet. In this worksheet, you can enter the bellows inside diameter number applies, ply thickness, and so forth, and the bellows material, allowable stress, and so forth. And when you do that, it will produce, it will use these formulas here that you see and produce stresses um, so they can do a fatigue life calculation. So I don't want to go into a spreadsheet in extensive detail. Bottom line is you have to make sure that you pass each of this, that you're successful, that your design is good enough. And the advantage of having a spreadsheet is you don't, you don't have to keep doing a hand calculation. So that's for initial design. Later on, you want to do a test to see if everything works out. Flow induced vibration is very important. Uh, and is an is a issue. Uh, when you have flow going at high velocity, the pipe will start vibrating, particularly the bellows. Some people put an internal flow liner in the bellows and that resolves that issue where you have this flow impingement onto the convolutions causing the vibration. Liners also have failed due to vibration. And so you, you basically have to do a calculation. Here is a picture of what's going on. There's a free stream here at the top. Uh, think of this as, as axisymmetric, so revolve this 360. You're gonna have vortex shedding here and that's gonna cause vibration as well. Flow going in and out and causing all kinds of dramatic things inside. So people have done calculations on vortex shading, uh, looking at first mode, second mode, third mode, fourth mode. 
and looking at how to reduce that interaction on the flow velocity. So you can see here at the bottom, that's the flow velocity, that's the RMS stress. And what we want to do is minimize that stress, right? And so you have to figure out what flow velocity will do that. And so, so a lot of people have looked at this through testing and analysis. Here you see uh, vortex shading again, uh, the vortex force, how much force you put into it. Uh, that makes sense. This is the dynamic pressure, this coefficient, this is your vortex coefficient, this is your elbow factor, and this is your vibration mode, or sorry, this is your area factor. But these calculations can be used, and it gives you stress even, where CS is your stress factor, for example, E is the modulus, and so T is the thickness, and so forth. So I don't want to go into this in extensive detail, but usually you check this through testing, and these equations can help you design against it. And these are the equations that are typically used. What is the lowest free stream axial velocity of the bellows? So you, you can see here it depends on the bellows axial spring rate, depends on the convolution height W, and the weight of the bellows. And that's how you calculate that. What is the lowest free stream lateral velocity of the bellows over the bellows? And so again, this is actually is lateral, but you, you do the same type of calculation here. For single bellows, uh, the actual vibration equation is this one. And again, here you're looking at um, the low stream actual velocity of bellows. Here you're looking at um, the mode of, of vibration, right? And K, I already discussed what it was, is a spring rate. Uh, so that's this overall actual spring rate. W is a weight uh, of the bellows, makes sense. So K over W is mass typically, sorry, K over W is your frequency as you've seen before. And CN is a constant that's used for uh, uh, determining if you're in the first vibration, second, third, and so forth. And those can be found through a table fairly easy table. Number of convolutions uh, can uh, impact these, uh, these modes. Lateral vibration, so that's a bending mode instead of axial. The one here is axial mode. Bending mode is a slightly different equation. And here DM is a weight, you know, here you have a diameter DM, that's what that is. LB is a length. And these are the same variables we talked about. For the first five modes, you can see C1, C2, C3 changing. That goes in this equation. Uh, I would like you to see uh, a, a, a video. Uh, we'll try to practice this problem using Abacus. But I have two YouTube videos that go into how to do that. It will be worthwhile to see if we can, we can do it good as a team. So I was discussing earlier, where should I use bellows? So here I have a pipe, a long straight pipe that's anchored at the end. And, but this has to expand thermally. Well, I think putting a bellows here is good because that way you're not putting excessive force into, the, into those arc anchors. And so, yeah, so that's why you want, you want, want to have it there as an example. Another example is uh, for, you, know, you can put a universal joint, for example, for thermal growth, if there was one. Here's another example yet. Uh, the same line now has this bellows joint, uh, multiple joints. And here you have the anchor, here you have the anchor. Um, and all you're trying to do is try to absorb that thermal expansion. So it's very similar to these ones, um, but with multiple bellows now. It takes the compression force basically. Um, Here you, have, you can have actual movements, but if you have another pipe branching off, you may wanna put a bellows there because maybe this is attached somewhere and this is moving around. So that'll give you flexibility as an example. The main anchor here is resisting the pressure thrust in the main line direction, right? Um, so every bellows is doing something special. 
one could be absorbing thermal and the other one is absorbing pressure thrust. Um, in this example, you see a pipe that's taking a change in direction from a flow. So the flow is changing direction. Uh, you also have ha actual thermal expansion. And you have intermediate anchors that help you out. Uh, but a bellows can be very useful to accommodate all those deflections. Yeah, so here's just a picture of that showing you a lateral angular combined movement. So you can see here the pin. It's a huge bellows in this case. In this example, I'm showing a bellows right over here. And this is just a single ex expansion joint. Again, taking that thermal expansion. Now, a pressure thrust cannot take, this cannot take pressure thrust. You have to provide some sort of anchor or something to keep everything in place. Example seven, you could have a situation where you have this shape that's straight initially, but this will expand, this will expand, causing the pipe to bend quite a bit. Well, you put a pipe, you put a bell here, and that'll accommodate it. Similarly, you may have a uni universe, universal expansion joint, so you have two of them in either side. Example eight is similar, um, similar approach, but now it's taking thrust as well. So any, anytime you take thrust, you take the tie rods, right? We talked about it. Example nine, you have lateral angular movement, um, very similar to example eight, except now we need the horizontal pipe to accept bending. And so you just put now attachments uh, from elbow to elbow. Example 10 is one where you could have deflections in multiple directions. So here you have a pipe going in one plane and then switching to another plane. Well, this bell has to accommodate both angles. Example 11 is a case where you have two vessels connected with, a, with bellows in between. And you need, you're going to have pressure and you need to find a way of, of absorbing that extra um, loading into these pipes. And the bellows can help you with that. You can have examples where you have gimbal and hinged. Again, taking that loading environment, uh, thermal, thermal loading typically, and the pressure. Example 18 is more dramatic. Uh, you have a highly flexible loop. Um, you have intermediate anchors, uh, and the, the bells again are helping you take that load. Or not take the load, but reduce the load going into the pipes. Example 20, another example of bells uh, using hinged and gimbaled uh, approaches. Typically when you design a bellows, you wanna have a very nice spec that shows everything, cycles, lateral movements, spring rate, everything here should be listed, vibration, flow velocity, and so forth. Uh, very nicely written, materials used, number convolutions, diameter, inner diameter, fluid media being used. Uh, it's like a checklist and it's very useful to look at, you know, what is the max pressure? What is the mean pressure? What is the temperatures? All that stuff is gonna play a big role in your assessment process. It's very important to have that spec sheet, sheet especially for bells. Another example, with data specs uh, right here, just a different um, spec sheet. Some people wanna uh, show a lot of information uh, with part numbers. And so here EX could mean exhaust. Here you have the pressure rating. Here you have the nominal diameter and so forth. So very useful uh, to just look at that and quickly know what you're talking about. 321 clearly does alloy, the alloy that you're talking about. Here's the number of convolutions you have and, and so forth. To order a bellows, first step, uh, you wanna make sure you have the right one. So size the line, design the pressure, design the temperature, come up with the loading conditions is what this is. Select the right materials so they're compatible with the fluid. Uh, figure out what kind of expansion joint you want. Here I provide a very quick example on this, but I don't wanna go through that because you, you can kind of pause it and look at it. Um, bottom line, you have to keep all these things in mind as you're designing. And there's formulas for all this stuff. 
yeah, so here's an, uh, an example of how to order, for example. And this is, a cat this is how a typical catalog will look like. Diameter, pressure rating, and so forth. Length, height, spring rates. A again, another example of ordering bellows. So that concludes the lecture for today. We covered bellows, which is a very important application where we've seen failures and we've seen them in launch vehicles and, and many other applications. So that's where we covered it today. And I hope you 